many thanks. Many thanks to, to both the EFTA Secretariat and to the EFTA Surveillance Authority for the invitation and for the opportunity to moderate uh, the panel on the institutional setup that allows for the participation of Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway in the internal market for financial services. It is a setup that has been explained well by previous speakers today, uh, and I will not take up any of our limited time to repeat the basics. As to the ESAs and ESA discussion, however, I will only add that we also have the European Space Agency. And when I say that I cooperate with ESA, people think I do space law. So I think they're even older than the EFTA Surveillance Authority. Further, um, I would also, as the only academic on the programme, note that the two-pillar solution does have its weaknesses. There are reasons why it took so long to find a workable compromise due to difficult constitutional red lines on both the EA EFTA side and, that is important to note, on the EU side, no right to vote. Um, and as with most, if not all, compromises, certain hard questions were brushed under the carpet. It is the job of independent academics to point this out, and so we have. So to the credit of the organisers, they have taken the risk of letting me moderate this session. Having said this, however, they have little to fear, because I shall have to admit that the compromise, compromises found appear to be working. And it has done so for almost six years now. So to some of you in the room or those of you following us online today, this might be just another example of a university professor addressing theoretical problems without practical relevance. Some might even say that this is the entire 30 year history of the EEA in a nutshell. It is mission impossible, but it works nevertheless. So, but how well does this system really work and will it continue to do so in future, in particular in light of recent developments within the EU as to the governance structure of relevant EU agencies? To discuss these questions, we have with us four high-level experts, all of them directors, I now realised, which each, each their different perspectives, that of the EU legislator, that of an EU supervisory authority, that of a national supervisory authority, and that of the EFTA surveillance authority. They are Mr. Martin Merlin, Director for Banking, Insurance and Financial Crime in the Commission's DJ FISMA, Ms. Sophie uh, Verlo Dignac, Head of Legal and Enforcement Department of the European Securities and uh, Markets Authority. Um, Ms. Junina Larosdottir, who is the Director of the Internal Market Affairs Department here at the EFTA Surveillance Authority, and Mr. Morten Baltersen, who is the Director General of the Norwegian Financial Supervisory Authority. Let us, as in the first panel, start with the Commission. So, Mr. Merlin, what does the future of financial services in an extended internal market that includes the EA after states look like from your perspective. Will this two pillar structure work also in the future? Thank, thank you very much for, for, for the invitation. Um, well, the future of financial services in the EU, um, that's, a, that's a broad topic. Uh, I can only say uh, expect uh, a lot of legislation, a lot of technical standards, uh, uh, much needed ones, but also very complex ones that uh, need to be uh, transposed and uh, and implemented, uh, especially as we move to a a different uh, world now, where we have to make sure that uh, the EU regulatory framework is adapted to the uh, digital age, and also to uh, the the conditions that are needed in order to make our economy uh, greener. Uh, so we. We always pray for a regulatory pause, uh, uh, and we've been doing that since the great financial crisis uh, back in 2008, 
but that regulatory pause in the area of financial services, unfortunately, does not seem to uh, to uh, to be with us yet. So expect um, a lot of uh, refinements of the regulatory framework, which, as I said, I, I think are, are needed, but we, we can discuss the details. Then it, when it comes to supervision, um, I I would not expect a, a, an overhaul in this area. Um, we will rather continue building on the three European supervisory authorities to make sure that we continue to develop and refine uh, uh, our uh, rule book uh, to continue to foster supervisory convergence, which is absolutely critical in order to make uh, the single market for financial services uh, work. Uh, uh, and we will continue to have uh, very targeted uh, areas where there is direct supervision uh, uh, at the European level. Uh, we have that now, for example, when it comes to uh, credit rating agencies, trade repositories. Uh, we may have another uh, example with green bond standards, external reviewers uh, uh, soon, um, third country CCPs as well, but uh, direct EU supervision is likely to remain quite, uh, quite exceptional. Um, uh, and we don't uh, sense that there is a need uh, to have an overhaul in that uh, respect. Uh, and we also don't sense following the ESAS review that we have carried out, that there is a lot of political appetite to make major changes in, uh, in this regard. With of course one exception, which is a bit uh, at the margins of uh, financial services. And this has to do with the fight against money laundering and terrorism financing where, as you know, the Commission has proposed uh, to have a European authority with direct supervisory powers over certain high-risk uh, obliged entities. Uh, that legislation still needs to be uh, approved uh, by Council and Parliament. We hope it will be the case by June next year. But wh what I can say on, on direct supervision by AMLA is that uh, it has a lot of support both in Council and the Parliament. And actually, it is the first time in my career that I see the Council asking for more direct European supervision than what the Commission has proposed. Um, and, and, and the same goes for, for the Parliament, I think, which is likely to be quite supportive, uh, I hope, of, uh, of uh, our ideas around direct supervision by AMLA. So this is, of course, uh, something to watch and uh, it will be up to EEA and EFTA states uh, to decide how they want to mirror that uh, in, in, in their respective uh, uh, setup. Otherwise, when it comes to, uh, to the two uh, pillar structure, we think it uh, works uh, reasonably uh, well from, uh, from our point of view. We, of course, fully respect uh, the desire on the side of EEA and EFTA states to have uh, autonomy and uh, and sovereignty when it comes to uh, transposing and implementing uh, EU laws uh, and not having an automatic entry into force that would be aligned with the entry into force decided upon by the European uh, legislator. Uh, we perfectly understand that, but we, and this will be this will not be a surprise to many of you in this room. We we do have a concern with the very significant uh, uh, backlog backlog that is out there in terms of uh, transposing uh, European laws into the uh, uh, EEA EFTA um, uh, pillar, so to speak. Uh, we have now around uh, 100 EU acts belonging to financial services legislation which still need to be adopted and implemented by the EEA EFTA states. Um, this clearly is a lot um, and it uh, creates risks of, you know, fragmenting the single market and undermining the confidence that uh, all member states and market operators have in, in the single market. So this is really something that we think should be, uh, should be addressed. We should all play our part to make sure that uh, um, uh, it is addressed. 
uh, and I guess we we cannot escape, uh, you know, where needed reinforcement of the teams that are responsible for transposing European laws into the EU EEA EFTA uh, pillar, because as I said at the very beginning, uh, the pace of uh, legislative legislative changes in the EU when it comes to financial services is uh, unlikely to, um, uh, to to be reduced in the coming uh, uh, months and years. Many thanks for that first uh, first intervention with uh, some uh, inside news concerning both the green bonds and AMLA. I think people probably found that quite interesting. And I think I can almost hear the sight of relief when you say that there will be no, well, direct supervision will only be in exceptional cases. Uh, I think the Ministry of Justice in Oslo and Reykjavik will probably be happy to, to hear that. Uh, you raised a number of things that I hope we will be able to come back to in, in the discussion, but let us now uh, move on to the perspective of an EU uh, supervisory authority. So, Ms. Wallo Dignac, can, can you tell us about the cooperation between ESMA and, well, both the, the national super, supervisory authorities of the EA EFTA states and perhaps in particular the EFTA surveillance authority? How has it worked so far and what are the challenges? you see in the future. Thank you very much. I have to, I have to confess that um, when I wake up in the morning, I rarely think about the two pillar model. <laughs> and why is that so? Probably because it actually works very well in the daily life uh, on the ground. Um, and I'm not saying this just to please my neighbors, <laughs> but indeed, uh, I think we've, and Verena said it before, um, we experience an excellent excellent cooperation um, with both the uh, EEA NCAs, but also with the EFTA Surveillance Authority. So uh, that's probably one, one main reason. Uh, another one is also that indeed over the past 11 years, we've uh, honestly haven't witnessed any, um, any uh, incident uh, affecting the orderly functioning of the markets in general that would stem from uh, the EEA states. Uh, there was no major issue in this respect. It doesn't mean, and uh, I think uh, Marta and Verna have been clear already, that it, everything works perfectly well. No, probably not. But I think it's important to take some time to also underline what works well. So let me start with this. Um, we've got indeed an effective participation in a board of supervisors, um, in our standing committees, in different groups, networks, um, from the three um, uh, competent authorities from uh, Norway, uh, Iceland and Liechtenstein. Um, we also involve very much the EFTA surveillance authority in all, especially our direct supervisory mandates. And the fact that these uh, four bodies have indeed a seat as a member at our board, even if without a voting right, I think um, in every meeting it, it doesn't show because we rarely really cast a vote uh, on several matters. There are clear rules for decision making, uh, qualified majority uh, or simple majority. Yes, this exists in the funding regulation. In practice, if you look at the agendas of our board, these are quite extensive. We very rarely indeed ask members to cast a vote. Um, so it, it works well, it, it helps this, this active participation also indeed help shape further the single rule book, achieve convergent outcomes uh, on supervision on the ground and, and, and foster the, uh, the, the CMU in general terms. Um, more specifically, maybe um, when we look at um, uh, national government authorities uh, in the states, uh, where their input is particularly relevant to us is really in the convergence area. And there, I think um, Verena mentioned the uh, high rate of compliance or intended compliance. And if you have the curiosity to log on to a website, you can see a complete uh, mapping of a compliance statement by EU and EA states NCAs. Um, and you will see indeed that um, there's a lot of green, well, different shades of green because there's the compliance and intention to comply. But for the, the three EA states authorities, really, this is very, very green. Um, 
we also onboard um, these authorities through our peer reviews that are quite intrusive. This also involves on-site visits. Um, uh, Iceland was visited recently uh, for the prospectus peer review. This has been published in July uh, and got a, a clear blessing of uh, the current setup for vetting prospectuses. Uh, Liechtenstein was also visited before um, and these visits were decided on because we need to review periodically and visit periodically uh, members, not because there were specific concerns arising. Um, so from, from all this convergence work, uh, maybe I could also add that we also receive a number of complaints against um, competent authorities. We have very few complaints against the, the three EA um, states and CAs. Um, so on all these um, grounds, um, there are no outliers in the EA states. Then turning to the um, EFTA Surveillance Authority, and we've got an alternate to a board here. Um, the, I think the relationship is probably uh, even stronger because we do have this close cooperation on direct supervisory mandate. Yes, there is one institution, this famous Nordic CRA. Uh, so it's not taking uh, all of our time, nor of your times probably, but uh, this is a case study for me uh, and, and it does work very well. There are clear, uh, clear agreements on who does what, clear contact points, periodic meetings. This CRA is part, completely part of our thematic uh, reviews, investigations, plans. So there's no separate uh, treatment uh, and it really um, uh, works, works very well on the ground. Um, there is one element that um, triggered a lot of attention at our end is that there are specific decisions that are time bound. Um, this is true, of course, for uh, an authorization uh, process, but it's true in other uh, areas as well. And there, interestingly, maybe uh, there is no specific provision, no extra time allocated um, for uh, decision making, despite having to prepare the work at ESMA level and take then the specific decision at the EFTA Supreme Authority level. Um, and this um, attention to timely decision making despite no specific extra time provided uh, could extend to, to other areas. So that's maybe one element of specific hurdle we have to, to face and, and work around. Um, this could be true, for example, uh, for uh, breach of union law investigations and recommendation. This is also obviously true because time is of the essence here in emergency situations. The roles are clearly delineated, but yes, there is a specific time pressure and therefore a specific uh, attention to be to be put there. And now if we look a bit further into um, what maybe could could work slightly differently or better, of course, the um, the the obvious candidate here is delay in implementation. I won't insist too much because Martin was quite sharp in his statement. There's a lot uh, in the backlog. Um, I have one interesting example that I would want to share with you today. It relates to Norway, so I thought it was interesting to to get there. Um, uh, the, we have a number of acts in our remit, uh, many, many actually. One is particularly dear to our hearts and is far reaching. This is MIFID, MIFIA, Market and Financial Instruments Directive Regulation. Um, this review, uh, the review of the old MIFID was uh, uh, finalized act uh, adopted in 2014. The incorporation into the EA agreement was only effective in 2019, five years later. Five years is really almost a century by financial standards. What happened in the meantime? Well, Norway in particular was quite desperate to get this done. So they tried hard and actually incorporated in their domestic legal order um, the revised provision of MIFID, MIFIA. And with this, we had the Oslo Stock Exchange knock on our door, notifying us that they, they want a specific decision related to Article 36, it's about trade feed uh, access provision. And well, the answer was, sorry, but we can't do anything here because even if indeed um, the um, EU Aki could be considered as already in force in Norway. There is no EEA Joint Committee decision, therefore there is no mutual recognition process and there's just nothing we can do about this. So just 
practical example of it is not only the EU side complaining here. It's I think also very true from from uh, from all parties. There's an awful lot of work to be done, but uh, it, it is important to um, not lose the momentum. Um, now, complexity uh, has been mentioned a couple of times in reference to complexity of EU acts. It is true that the governance that um, stemmed from the um, uh, creation of the ESAs with binding decisions on the um, uh, on the desks of the FTA surveillance authority with no effective sanctioning powers whatsoever, but we could issue recommendations. And if so, then it would be for the national authorities to take up uh, this recommendation, if not implemented by the global player, to effectively act upon, potentially sanction, EU EEA financial market participants using those global cloud service providers. That gives you a bit of an idea of uh, <laughs> what's what's ahead of us in terms of organization and, and smooth work. And with this, I will just end with um, a genuine question. What was a groundbreaking change in the EU was the shift from directive to regulation. This addressed the issue of transposition delay, of slight adaptation that were not just technical glitches, um, and, and it, it was really a game changer. And I wonder, I wonder, but this is not even as, as an ESMA speaker here, it's just really as a, an EU citizen, I wonder whether a direct effect of the EEA Joint Committee decisions is something that is just completely not conceivable or whether maybe some sort should be given to it. Thank you. Thank you. Some very interesting questions there, in particular towards the end, and some questions for the national authorities as well that I hope uh, well doesn't will will pick up on. I will only have to confess that I do sometimes work up, uh, wake up in the morning thinking about the two pillar <laughs> model. Um, but um, uh, it, it's perhaps reassuring that ESMA uh, does not. I'm happy to hear. Uh, let us then move on to the perspective of, of uh, a national supervisory authority, Mr. Bantasen. You got some questions there. You can address them now or, or later. But what are the strengths and the weaknesses of the one market, two pillar solution as, as you see it? But first of all, I'm glad to be here and I would like to thank the EFTA Surveillance Authority, ESA, sorry, ESA, <laughs> and, uh, and the EFTA Secretariat for, for hosting this conference. Um, I can subscribe to the to the uh, view already presented uh, that uh, over participation in the uh, supervisory cooperation in the European Union works well as um, as uh, intended. Uh, we we uh, participate on an equal footing, uh, enjoying all the same rights and taking on the same obligations as our EU peers. And there's of course one important exception that we can't uh, can't vote. And this is not only figures of speech from my side, but uh, I can confirm that this is uh, realities, and we are we are listened to, and uh, we can exert influence by the power of professional arguments. So uh, yes, that works well. Uh, also, when it comes to to our cooperation with. Uh, Sorry, I have to say EFTA surveillance uh, authorities, <laughs> not to confuse anyone, uh, to avoid any confusion. Uh, it, it works uh, well uh, in, indeed. Um, uh, well, it's fair to say that there haven't been a, um, a large extent of cases that we have had to handle so far, but that extent will grow in, in, in the future and we have to prepare for that. But, in, but the, the principles laid down in, in the two pillar system will uh, will not change. So it uh, is an institutional setup uh, there uh, that should absorb more and perhaps also more sensitive and more complex cases to, to be handled by, by the EFTA Surveillance Authority in, in the future. Uh, that could, of course, uh, the, uh, although the role will be the same, uh, the, the workload will, will increase and all, that also raises 
I would think also uh, an issue of, of resources allocated to, to this uh, capacity. And, and when it comes to financial uh, markets, um, uh, the, the, the as, as Marika also have, uh, has uh, alluded to, you have two different uh, competencies actually. One as a surveillance authority in financial markets, uh, but also one uh, competence as uh, supervisory authority. Uh, and on the EU side, these are separate competencies, respectively the Commission uh, as a surveillance uh, authority for the well functioning of the internal market and uh, the three ESAs. Uh, and uh, this has worked well and will probably work well in the future as well, but there is perhaps a potential uh, conflict of interest between these two, uh, two uh, roles that you should uh, pay attention to. This has not been a problem in practice, but uh, one can foresee that this could be could create some tensions and that also raises the issue whether uh, you will need uh, a, perhaps a different setup in, in, in the FTA surveillance authority. And it's an extreme version, uh, the, the issue also whether it's necessary to, to establish a separate FTA uh, authority, but that is not a proposal, but uh, it's it's naive not to, to address the, what uh, can be uh, met or, or challenges, but the challenges that we can meet in, in the future. Um, I would also like to, to comment on the issue of, of, of uh, delayed uh, incorporation in the EA or backlog of, of legal acts, uh, which both of you uh, addressed. And of course, I think, and, and, uh, First of all, the uh, FSA is not a party in this. Is. We are not negotiating the, the transposition and amendments of, of, of EU legal acts, uh, but, but uh, still we have to, to handle it in, in practice. And of course, all parties of, 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 of the treaty, EEA treaty, uh, are obliged to, to, to do their utmost to, to uh, secure uh, a swift transition, transposition into the EEA. Uh, and uh, without any unnecessary delays. But we have, as you pointed to, we have in, uh, experienced some significant delays, uh, like for instance, BFID, MIFIR, uh, also after the, the, that the ESA's uh, regulations were incorporated in, in the EEA, so we can't blame that <laughs> any longer. Uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say that although we it, it, the process of negotiating uh, the legal uh, amendments to, to the legal acts before they are incorporated into, into to the EEA, uh, can be time consuming for some times. And not only perhaps uh, due to, to, uh, to like for instance, uh, constitutional uh, reservations in, in the EFTA states, but also for other reasons, it's uh, time to time, this is a complex matter. Uh, and I think we have to recognize that it's <laughs> inherent in the EEA concept that there sometimes will be a delay. Uh, do the utmost to, to, to avoid it, but there will be. And, and uh, under such circumstances, it's important that all um, parties uh, do our utmost also to, to find practical uh, solutions to solve these challenges. Uh, and um, uh, you, you need some certain pragmatism from both sides, and you uh, alluded to, to, to uh, the quite tense situation that we came up in back some years ago with, with uh, MIFID and MIFIR, uh, not, uh, not being uh, transposed in the EEA. Uh, and you should also remember that if we were able to find solutions with certain pragmatism exercised both by ESMA, and thank you a lot for that, 
uh, and also Norwegian uh, authorities. So we we wish we should avoid such situations, uh, of course, but but we have to also recognize that this will this kind of problems will appear from time to time, and we have been able to to address them and solve them so far. Thank you. I think we will come back to the backlog in the discussion, but uh, finally uh, our host today, the EFTA Surveillance Authority, uh, Ms. Laurus, you have you have the floor. What are your thoughts on on one the one market to pillar solution? Uh, let me just state this very simply. This solution has worked very well in practice. So and if I may elaborate a bit. Uh, Stefan Parika talked about how the solution is, and uh, I think it's maybe also good for us to, to keep in mind that although we only have one entity to supervise, we have been taking seven decisions based on this uh, system, uh, and a part of them are, are uh, notification on short selling, what Sophie was talking about, where we had to take decisions in, in parallel. Um, but the, the sol solution in, 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 in a nutshell is that the after surveillance authority takes decision based on a draft from, from the, the agencies. Um, that can be uh, registration of, of entities, but that can also be uh, issuing of, of binding rules. Um, I can share with you when I, I studied this solution uh, the first time, uh, that ESA takes decision based on draft. And my thought was, wow, okay, great solution. Um, how is this going to function in practice? Where is the independence of the authority, uh, etc.? And I can share with you when I when I joined the authority two and a half years ago, I was so pleasantly surprised to see how this has worked worked in practice. And if there's anything I want you to take away from my intervention here today is that uh, the EFTA Surveillance Authority, ESA, takes independent decisions in the field of financial services. So, and I maybe go through it a bit, how it, how it works in, in practice, because this has only been going on for, for, for six years now, and, uh, and we have some, some uh, experience to, to share with you. So as, as Sophie mentioned, we are members of the board without voting rights, and that is, of course, a very valuable source of information, source of, of discussion, etc. Um, there we know what, what, if, if there's something coming up, for example, in, in relation to the binding decisions, etc. We notify the, uh, the national competent authorities. We, we have a very active, a very good dialogue with, with everyone. We surely get draft from, from ESMA. But it's not as we are rubber stamping. It's not as we are copy pasting. We evaluate it, the, the draft independently in, in ESA. We, of course, have access to the expertise in ESMA. So the, the drafts that we receive are, are super good. And, and with some evaluation on the market conditions, um, you can see it from the decisions that we took in 2020 on notification on short selling how we evaluate the market conditions in the EEA after states and see and it's our role to evaluate the market conditions there and whether they justify the the the, the measures taken so it is an independent and these these decisions are not uh, not the, not the same so we get this draft from, from ESMA, we evaluate them, we send them back, uh, we maybe get another draft, we are in cooperation with the national competent authorities, and when we are happy, the, the decision-making process in ESA uh, is initiated, and that uh, involves legal review from our legal executive uh, team, and, and then a decision made by my ESA college. So this is an independent uh, decision. Um, and I think, as everyone here, uh, and I think there are some people in the room that were part of finding this solution, and I think they could be very proud of, uh, of their work. 
Uh, and I think also that the people that uh, came before me uh, can also be proud because in the end we are all human beings and this cooperation has been going going very well. Um, so I think uh, people people can be proud and happy about about this um, solution. Um, the the challenges ahead, uh, uh, we will see, as has been mentioned, more agencies, more keys, uh, more fields. We in the EFTA Surveillance Authority, we place emphasis on being a credible partner. We place emphasis on having good cooperation with ESMA. We have we have placed a lot of focus on the financial services. It's the college member who is a member of the board. Um, and and we place emphasis in taking on and being a credible partner in those tasks that are vested with the authority. The authority has changed a lot in, in the recent six years. We have had a lot of new task regulatory tasks and we have done everything that we have uh, have could to 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 take those tasks on and and um, uh, progress with them in in a credible manner. So we stand ready and we are happy with uh, with the the statements made by by the EU site. Uh, it's it's easy for me to to come here now and say that the solution is working well when that has already been said by my by my colleagues. And of course, as an independent and academic, I reserve the right to to conclude on how independent the ASA really is until I, <laughs> until I see a decision where the draft from ESMA and the decision by ASA goes in different directions. Um, so we'll see in future. But uh, that's for another day. Um, many thanks for, for the first round of interventions. There are many topics we should discuss, but there is one I would like to, to start with because several of you, uh, including Commission, mentioned that there will be more rules. There will be more rules, there will be more hard law, there will be more soft law. And um, one thing the three EA after states have in common is that they are not that big. So how is this for small states? Uh, and the national uh, authorities of small states, are they able to cope with this? Uh, this volume, all all the regulations, all the the guidelines, and everything that that that, that is coming, and we will have more. And I, I would again like the Commission to start because the EU too, of course, have big member states and small member states. So do you do you see the same thing there that the smaller member states struggle with keeping their head above water? And then let's continue and hear how that looks from from the EFTA pillar. Of course, I can only uh, acknowledge that uh, uh, the, the workload is immense. Um, I, I haven't made the, the, the exact uh, calculations to see uh, how many smaller member states are late with uh, transposing EU law, but I, I, my general feeling is that uh, first, clearly, we have small member states in the EU as well, as you rightly said. And on the whole, my sense is that they are doing a pretty good job uh, at, uh, you know, uh, keeping up the pace uh, of uh, uh, changes which are made to the EU regulatory framework. Uh, so, of course, we have uh, quite a number of uh, infringement procedures uh, ongoing uh, for lateness of transposition or uh, uh, incomplete uh, transposition of EU law. But I haven't noticed, I must say, that these infringement proceedings are concentrated in the so-called small member states. Uh, so it does seem that uh, on the whole, they are finding ways to, you know, keep up with the pace of changes and uh, transpose uh, European uh, laws and, uh, and, and and technical standards fairly swiftly, or at least I don't get the sense that they are slower than some of our large member states. Huh? Uh, but of course, that would need to be checked, you know, in an accurate manner and see what the statistics are. But I'm 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 pretty confident in saying that uh, they do they do a a pretty a pretty good job. Uh, which uh, 
leads me to think that uh, uh, size is not really what uh, what matters here, but uh, uh, what what is important is that uh, you know countries are uh, are well organized, uh, sufficiently staffed, uh, in order to transpose EU law uh, in a swift uh, in a swift manner. That's interesting, but that's then at the level of the legislator. But when it comes to the national authorities, uh, would anyone like to comment on, on, on that? So, of course, step one, transposition, but then it comes application. If you go for regulation. Exactly. In of the course. EU only. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but we have to implement, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you raised that issue because from a, from a FSA's uh, point of view, our main concern is not the viability of the two pillar system in the EA, but it's this issue on the, the, the burden uh, uh, posed by, by uh, increased uh, uh, legislation, both in terms of pages, uh, legal acts, and, and not least complexity. And each piece of this new legislation can be justified on its own ground. But when you uh, combine <laughs> the, uh, the requirements, uh, I'm not sure if we any more see the forest for trees, uh, but that I have no illusion whatsoever that uh, this will be different uh, in the foreseeable future. So as a supervisor, we simply have to cope with it and adapt as good as we can. Uh, and, um, it, it's uh, we have to 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 bridge the gap, uh, the growing uh, gap between available resources and the combined uh, obligations uh, and also expectations that we need. Uh, being a part, uh, enforcing this this uh, huge rulebook and complex rulebook, and also also. Uh, taking part of the supervisory uh, cooperation uh, in, 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 in the uh, EA. And our approach will have to simply be, have, be uh, how can we uh, contribute to the best possible goal achievement, financial stability and well-functioning market, which means also that we have to accept that we will not reach the best practice uh, in a lot of fields. We will have to accept being rebuked and, uh, and being criticized both by the uh, European supervisory uh, authorities, by the EFTA surveillance authority perhaps, uh, and, uh, and also market participants and also political authorities. But that's the only way we can cope with it. But we have, we feel strongly that we have certain obligations uh, but to be honest, it's not possible simply to, to, to reach the level that is expected of us on, on every separate piece of supervision and legislation. Janina, you asked for a comment. Just uh, on the backlog a bit, uh, as there is no representatives here from, from our states as well. Um, of course, in 2010 to 2016, uh, there was a lot of backlog uh, because, you know, there was not a solution regarding the, the SS and that led to uh, many keys not being incorporated in, 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 in the agreement. This has been improving. So just for that to be mentioned here, um, because I can sort of feel it from the audience that uh, some people want to, that to, to, to be mentioned. Uh, so I'm happy to do that. And in relation to that, and you're talking about small states, then I can happily also inform you that Liechtenstein, which is our far uh, smallest state, is the best in class. So I think this is not a question of, of size. I think this is more a question of, of uh, um, prioritization, um, uh, leniency, etc. Of course, Liechtenstein is special in the three states not having to uh, implement uh, regulations, but still, I, I think they deserve uh, being mentioned here in relation to small states. 
that would be my immediate answer. I mean, they have the advantage of a modest system, so regulations will have a direct effect. And of course, uh, the advantage of having a, a German as an official language. So they, both Iceland and Norway, of course, has to, to, to um, do a lot of work um, there. But, but uh, this backlog question is, is, is really interesting. And it was brought up in the first session by Harald Franke Lund and his keynote, it was mentioned by several members in the in the first panel. It was mentioned again by the commissioner and by both the representatives from from let's call the, the EU side uh, now. And and I know that it's it's better than it was a few years ago. But still, when you hear all the stories of of the, the legal acts that have not been taken into the EA agreement, and you take into consideration the nature of financial markets. I have to say that as an outside observer, I am a bit surprised that it that it works. And and I would so is there a sort of so far it has worked, it is pragmatism, goodwill involved, but is this sustainable? And I would challenge the EU to the ESMA and the Commission to reply first, because I mean we, because you always bring this up understandably, but nevertheless, as long as it works, the EFTA states then can sort of think that well the, the EU side would would like us to do better, but it still works. But where is sort of the red line and how, how, can this go on like this? Well, it, it, it works because fortunately uh, the backlog has reduced over time and we have found solutions to the uh, ESAs being new players uh, in the landscape. So, of course, uh, that's good news. It works in spite of uh, many uh, uh, texts not being transposed and implemented, but probably at a certain price uh, in the countries concerned in terms of uh, investor protection uh, uh, at a price in terms of, uh, you know, distortions of competition, which might be small ones on the market, but uh, which are nevertheless there. And, and, and potentially also it may come at uh, the price of, uh, you know, lowering uh, our standards uh, to maintain financial stability. Uh, so, of course, we are all broadly satisfied with how it works. Uh, um, it is true that uh, the backlog uh, um, does not uh, seem to, uh, you know, uh, uh, hamper the overall functioning of the system, but for sure it must have a price uh, at, uh, you know, uh, in the market. Uh, again, for the sake of investor and consumer protection, and also, I have to add that uh, it is not conducive to the highest level of confidence uh, between uh, those uh, states that uh, transpose and implement uh, always on time and those which, for a variety of reasons, uh, are late in this process. And these can be EEF states. They can also be uh, uh, some of our member states, of course. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, there's a confidence issue here that uh, you know uh, needs to be uh, needs to be taken into account. Hmm. Sophie, would you care to, to comment from Esma's uh, perspective? I think it might be that we were lucky uh, so far that there was not a specific decision that would have to be taken urgently without any indeed legal basis for doing so. So maybe we were lucky, right? Um, then, OK, we're not involved in the process, uh, but what we can do to try and facilitate this is um, provide specific and also addressing the issue of uh, being overwhelmed with uh, EU law. Uh, we provide supervisory briefings. We collectively, the board, the members prepare and uh, the board endorses uh, supervisory briefings, provide guidance, Q&As, so we provide templates, we, so we try to facilitate and pre chew the implementation phase that will come after the incorporation into the EA agreement. And also, I think by signaling publicly from an NCA perspective that there is the intent to apply, I think the message to the market is there already, even if legally speaking, uh, and this doesn't address the legal certainty issue, of course, but there is this message sent to the market that this is coming, that 
it will be implemented, that the tools are there, and there's willingness. It doesn't make up for having a proper implement incorporation, but I understand that the, the gap is getting a bit narrower. Um, this is also a matter of resources, I guess. And uh, I think it's good to, to keep the pressure, not just the momentum. Uh, uh, there were limited cases where indeed unhappiness was also expressed at ESMA's board um, due to potential uh, unfair competition edge, um, but that were really the exception rather than the rule. And because that is why we always focus on, and there might be some reasons for that, I think it's also fair to hear today also emphasize the unseen bigger part of the iceberg. It's a good point. And uh, drawing on experience from other fields of the internal market, sometimes I think part of the reason why why the backlog has not created bigger problems in other fields of the internal market, besides the pragmatism and all of that, is that many of the market operators, they don't know. In many fields, they think that EAA law is immediately EU law, so they just pretend that they, and, and sometimes even national authorities do that. But in this field where you have the, the ESAs and you have uh, compliance and you have uh, basically more lawyers involved, you will ask the questions that you perhaps don't ask in other parts of the internal market, which just simply take for granted that the rules are the same. And even if they're not, nobody realizes until afterwards and then it, it works. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that, you know, we, we stress test banks, but have we stress test uh, the two pillar solution uh, when it comes to, to financial services? Because so far, perhaps we've been lucky, but what if, we're not that lucky and, and, and the wrong case pops up at the wrong time. But I know these are difficult questions and, and we don't have any representatives of the EFTA states uh, in, in the panel, but Nina, would you care to comment or? You're trying to get us on a pessimistic <laughs> road here. <laughs> no, no, we will no. end on a high note. <laughs> Uh, I can share with you that I was working in one of the systematically important banks in Iceland uh, 2010 to 2019, where we had all the backlog and we experienced that in the bank that we, we got some questions about investor protection, etc. But I can also tell you that uh, in the bank, uh, we were preparing for the implementation of MIFID and, and GDPR and all these uh, ICs before mm before they were presented to, to Parliament. So uh, I think this is, um, and of course, if you want me to be on the pessimistic road, uh, I can tell you that it's also a bit cumbersome for, for the after surveillance authority when there is this gap or where there is this sort of time uh, lapse because uh, we are of course implementing or uh, surveying the, the keys that have been incorporated into the agreement and sometimes this sort of hampers the the dialogue uh, with with our counterparts in the commission or the or the agencies and um and it of course has has impact on, on the homogeneity um but i think um we have to take this all into context and um and i I, I, I want to allow myself to be positive here and, and say that uh, we, we found this good solution that led to the fact that all the keys in the, uh, uh, in the financial sector could be incorporated into the, into the agreement as they stood there. Of course, we have challenges ahead, but now we have a solution that I'm telling you that works well and everyone has been telling you that it works well. <laughs> And I do take notes and, uh, and I accept that it seems to be working well. So it's, it's, it's the EA in a nutshell. It's mission impossible, but it's still here. Um, but I, I should add that after hearing you again, uh, I did not mean to neglect uh, the, the importance of this issue because uh, it's key. Uh, and I think the system as such should should improve and it's easy for me to say because uh, the FSA is not uh, taking part of the, of the, <laughs> the process uh, negotiating new uh, EU legislation into to the, um, uh, the the incorporation in the EEA but yes uh, this is a challenge and we have uh, experienced it uh, and but, but still I think 
realistically speaking, we, we, we have it's inherent in, in a system where new uh, legislation is adopted in the EU. It needs to be amended, negotiated and amended before it can be incorporated in, in the uh, EEA agreement and made applicable for, for EEA EFTA states. Um, so, so we have to be prepared that such challenges that we have faced at some occasions can, um, can uh, happen again simply. And uh, if I may be blunt, if you seek obstacles, you will always find them. If you seek solutions, you will find them as well. So I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic too, and I don't think it's pessimistic to, to sort of stress test the system before the problem is there. It's better to do it in, in, uh, in uh, good weather and uh, among friends and the conferences like this, and then uh, try to, to find solutions before you, you have to come up with ad hoc um, solutions. Um, um, we have a little few minutes more. I think there is one more detailed question I have concerning AMLA, the Anti-Money uh, Laundering Authority and its and its governance structure, because I know it is uh, of interest to the uh, EA after states in particular, a bit concerned when this we have this two pillar model and it we found the solution and then there are changes on the EU side with this um, executive board. And I understand that uh, the regulation is still not uh, through the legislative process, but is the executive board still there? Yeah, I mean, on paper, it's uh, very much alive, yes. Um, uh, it has been uh, endorsed uh, by uh, the Council in its partial uh, general approach. Uh, so it was interesting to see that the Council largely endorsed what we had proposed for the governance of AMLA in general. So on one hand, an executive board small executive board which would be tasked in particular of taking um, uh, supervisory decisions directly applicable to uh, obliged entities and on the other hand two general boards one in supervisory composition one in FIU composition um, uh, that would in particular develop uh, technical standards uh, guidelines and the board in its supervisory composition uh, and that's an add-on from the council, would also have the possibility to give an opinion to the executive board before supervisory decisions are taken. No? Uh, but that was endorsed by council. I cannot speak uh, uh, for the parliament because uh, we still await uh, the parliament's uh, uh, final uh, report on the matter, but I, the direction it in which the discussions uh, seem to be going is that uh, on the whole parliament should be fine with this uh, structure as well uh, in a in a broad sense uh, which i think is good news because it is a very european uh, structure uh, so we keep of course the network of the 27 competent authorities uh, which uh, you know uh, you know, make the EU and exchange views and cooperate and and foster supervisory convergence and develop the rule book. So we really make use of the expertise that is there in the national competent authorities, both for supervision and FIU uh, work. But we also make sure that we have a very well European and well functioning board when it comes to taking difficult decisions. And we know from the past that sometimes it has been difficult for certain uh, uh, boards in the ESAs to, to take difficult decisions huh? um, uh, because of the governance structure. So here we are moving towards uh, something that is very European and that we hope will be quite uh, quite effective. So we would have a... a, a a governance which would be closer to the one that we have for the single resolution board. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, so we think this is a, this is a positive development from 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 the Commission's point of view. So, how this is going to be reflected in the EFTA that, that states? Was, that was my follow-up question. Is, well, that but the follow-up question <laughs> would be for one of my colleagues on the panel because <laughs> it might be quite uh, complex indeed. Um, but 
yes, this is the, the direction of travel, and I, I expect this to be uh, to be uh, adopted uh, for good by Council and Parliament mid next year. Because uh, as you may know, the EEA EFTA states they sent a so-called EFTA comment to to the EU side. Uh, well, and I'm a bit blunt, so please excuse that. But it, it basically it said, please don't uh, come up with this executive board because it will create constitutional problems in Iceland and Norway. <laughs> And, and sent it to the EU side. And uh, well, I'm not surprised that it was not uh, not decisive for the policy decisions within the EU, to put it that way. But it, uh, will any, anyone else try to come up with some thoughts how this could be adjusted to the uh, well, I'm side. just a humble civil servant, so uh, I will not comment on, on, on the positions of, of, of the, of the uh, governments of, of um, Iceland and, and Norway, but but uh, I think as I, um, as we have touched upon earlier today, the institutional setup uh, in the EEA with the two pillars principle should, uh, as such, um, be uh, be um, uh, or offer a framework also to to um, to uh, cope with this new uh, structure as far as I can see it. Perhaps some uh, adaptions uh, necessary, but, but in principle, I would believe that the, the, the two pillars structure is, is, is capable of also absorbing this uh, new piece of legislation uh without having expressed any views on its uh, content hmm. and then we have the green bonds uh regulation that is still not through the, through the process but um um as far as i understood it there might be um well the the, the direct supervision by esma is still very much part of of that um package i i, I think indeed it uh, has been endorsed by Council and Parliament, and it is now on the table of uh, of the trilogues. So I expect that to be uh, to be confirmed indeed, and I I trust that we will find a solution for the EFTA states in in this regard too. Um, and then we we are coming towards the uh, the end. But uh, another thing, I've I've taken many notes many notes uh, today, and one of the things I, I've noted is that many speakers uh, on both the e in the EFTA pillar and the EU uh, pillar has noted that this two pillar solution that we now have with the EU ESAs and and and, and the EFTA surveillance authority allows for much more cooperation between the pillars than we had before that the fact that uh, the national authorities uh, are there that the ASA takes part that's quite interesting and and something would would anyone like to 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 elaborate a little bit uh, on that because it's not that well known in the in, at least not in the in the debate in in in, uh, in the after states i think that gives sort of access that uh, well as was said in one of the uh, keynotes, the EA after states are not third countries in this regard. You want me to? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can I can uh, say a few words maybe on, uh, about that. Uh, I mean, what is interesting when you when you uh, when you sort of get to know the the agencies, the EU agencies, is that. Uh, the EFTA Surveillance Authority has a has a seat by the table as an onboarding member, as has been said here to, before. Also, the countries, the the national competent authorities in uh, Iceland, Norway, and Liechtenstein have a seat by the table, and they take part in the discussion. That is not the case when 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 EU is is uh, at, uh, taking on some uh, keys or or something like that, then we don't have a have a seat by the table when when discussing some legislative proposals or the the countries that that uh, that we are surveying in the after surveillance authority. So, in a way, it can be uh, argued that the the. EEA EFTA states and the EFTA Surveillance Authority have more formal status when it comes to the agencies when uh, vis-a-vis sort of the, the normal original uh, uh, keys. Um, 
however, that is something that we in the EFTA Surveillance Authority also, are also looking into, you know, to have further uh, further dialogue uh, and closer dialogue with the Commission in, in other, other fields as well. But this is a formalized and a memorandum of understanding, etc. So it's easier um, to sort of formalize the, the cooperation. Great, I think the time is running out. Um, so I will just try to end on a positive note. It, it works um, and it relies on, on, on pragmatism and goodwill. And that is, it works because of events like this. And people like you and uh, of course if we as long as it relies on goodwill and pragmatism and we need to meet more often we need to need to have events <laughs> like this so that you can turn that into a positive thing um uh, as well so great many thanks for your for your thoughts um uh, and uh, a round of applause for our panel <laughs>